you all for joining us. Got it. Thank you all for joining us during your lunch hour. And I will, let's see, we'll go on to the agenda. <clears throat> so on the agenda today, I'll describe the purpose of today as well as the overall purpose of the Waterfront Eureka Plan. I'll briefly describe the plan area, the role of the specific plan, uh, your priorities uh, in the plan area, which will be a back and forth conversation. Then we'll do a SWOT survey, which is also gonna be part of the conversation. It stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, and then I'll go over the outreach and project timeline. So, so you've probably already seen this before if you attended our other meetings, but so I'll go through it briefly. So the purpose of the Waterfront Eureka Plan is to provide a roadmap for development and redevelopment of the vacant and underutilized sites and buildings along and near Eureka Central Waterfront and to plan for at least 115 new housing units. So Again, today's purpose, we're gonna review the plan area, the role of the specific plan, and we want to hear from you. So here is the plan area, the commercial, it, it, well, let me back up, it encompasses approximately 130 acres, which includes the commercial Bayfront, which is the largest district with the most vacant and underutilized parcels. Uh, we have Old Town, which is, has the most existing services and businesses. And then the library district, which is primarily residential uh, with similar redevelopment potential to Old Town, but with considerably more surface area parking. Caitlin, was it 115 up units across the whole, that those three regions, subregions? Correct. Yes, Thank you. correct. Okay. That's the goal to at least get 115 more residential units within the plan area. So the role of the specific plan is to implement the 2040 general plan, which called for the creation of a specific plan in policy LU 2.11 uh, to create a framework to focus community efforts and, and enhance the ability to attract funding for reinvestment in the city's core area. So the city's core area includes all of the plan area as well as the downtown zoning district but the downtown zoning district is entirely located within the inland zone. So this effort uh, focused on the coastal zone portions of the core area because the coastal zoning regulations are very old and they don't support development of more housing. Uh, whereas in the inland zone, which was updated in 2019, it really does support the development of housing. Uh, the the goal of this effort is also to implement CEQA streamlining, which requires the consultant to conduct an environmental analysis to satisfy uh, the requirements of CEQA for not only the actual plan, the Waterfront Eureka plan itself, but as well as to facilitate environmental clearance of subsequent projects that are consistent with the Waterfront Eureka plan. And also the plan will develop straightforward development standards consistent with the vision of the 2040 general plan and the local coastal program. So um, you see the photo here, this is kind of a recent photo of a vacant parcel near Old Town and the library district within the planning area. And we had some scenario planning that was done and it could, you, if you could envision something like, oh, I went too fast, <laughs> excuse me, like this. And so we do have uh, three sites that were picked in each plan area and three scenarios for each site. Uh, so that will be up on the website soon. I'll talk about it later that you can review. Are these private or publicly owned or both? Uh, both. So the examples are on private parcels and I think one was on a public, but they're just, they're strictly for uh, conceptual, so people could see like the massing and scale of, of buildings. So your priorities. Uh, so this slide will talk about um, what is most important to you to address in the plan area. And so far in the meetings that we've had, we've heard what's important is obviously increasing housing options, preparing for sea level rise and improving vibrancy on the street. So I am going to stop screen sharing so we can all see each other's faces and have an open discussion about what uh, is most important um, to address to you as representatives of the various committees and commissions of the city in the plan area. Uh, let's see, stop. So anyone can, if you wanna type in the chat, um, if that's more comfortable for you, you can do that um, or just 
speak out. So we're hoping like, not just like your personal follow the plan area, but you as a representative of your committee, what would be most important to address from your committee's perspective? I'll, I'll take a stab for the parks and open space committee. Certainly we are, you know, our goal is to, to have uh, places where the most people can get outdoor recreation. That being said, part of that is you have to have people down there. And so, I mean, the housing, the housing component, I think is, is critical to um, increasing foot traffic, which also, I think it was of the top three that housing hits two of those sea level rise, of course, is not separate, but, um, but uh, not quite, not quite the same as the others. Thank you. Yeah, that would make sense. You you need more people to have more recreational opportunity opportunities to get that funding, especially mm -hmm. for that. Thank yeah, you. it's true. Yeah. I'd say I'm interested in mixed use uh, zoning, I guess, which I'm assuming that's probably what's gonna what's gonna happen here. But uh, you know, that it basically, you know, having say apartments or whatever on floors above retail or other commercial things happening below. And then, which I think would help, I'm on the Traffic Safety Commission. I think it's important to have mixed use because then people don't have to travel so far. It's easier to walk and bike to get to whatever you need. And, uh, and probably like, I don't know. I think it's important to not get too concerned with parking. Uh, I know everybody wants lots of parking, but I think we need to get to a point where uh, people are walking and biking more and not needing to park a car as much. <laughs> so, Right. Do you think that would be important in in all of the districts in the plan area, or do you think maybe one more over the other, or just yeah, in general in this area? I think in general, I think wherever whatever we're doing, mixed use would really be a great idea, and um, it just you know it. There's I've lived in the places where there's housing right next to retail, and it's really super nice to just walk out of your apartment or whatever it is and go do or get the thing you need by walking <laughs> there's it feels wonderful you know and uh and if more people are out doing that i think it will help uh with uh, motor vehicle traffic people slowing down to a common you know there's there'll be more people out i think people will drive more careful around other you know all the people that are walking biking mm -hmm. I completely agree with what Mark um, and Jack already said, particularly around increasing activity. Um, <clears throat> and one thing that we talked about at the Planning Commission, my name is Delo, and I represent the Planning Commission at this meeting, um, is drawing activity up along 2nd Street between basically where our existing commercial activity ends at I Street up to the Carson Mansion. And making sure especially tourists and residents you know feel safe basically accessing the waterfront facilities and accessing the carson mansion and feel like it's a real friendly and pedestrian friendly part of our downtown and i agree that with mark that i don't think we necessarily need to prioritize parking i think prioritizing activity um, is more important but obviously it's a balance Hi, I'm Aubrey here with the Economic Development Commission, just echoing what everyone else is saying. Definitely um, interested in expanding the kind of pedestrian focused areas and making more of the waterfront um, generally encouraging of like retail and other um, visitation activities. Um, I think it's like one of the most beautiful parts of Eureka and think there's more things we could do to utilize the area in a variety of ways. Definitely um, also supporting uh, mixed use and um, pedestrian focused 
policies. And also, um, finally, we appreciate the uh, CEQA element of this plan and that it'll be streamlining that because um, anything we can do to help uh, development be easier is good. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Um, one, or is the city going to be looking at using this to apply for grants to develop any of the properties ourselves in the future? Um, and then secondly, I was wondering, um, I haven't really followed the um, cold storage story and what's going on with that. Is that still being looked at for this area of Eureka? Oh, yeah, I, I can take that one, Caitlin. Right. <laughs> um, the uh, cold storage I'll start with first. Uh, there was a recent um, effort with uh, North Coast Coders Association and some other entities, the Fisherman's Marketing Association, as well as um, Humble County um, Economic Development staff. And we looked at different locations. You know, the story for cold storage is basically we could always get funding to, to, to build it and put it there. It's the operation and the sustainability of that operation. Um, without an anchor store that can relies on it like a big fishing company. Um, we spoke with a um, company out of Bellingham, I forget the name of them. They had some interest and it never panned out. One of the locations that we were looking at was Dock B, which is down the street from um, the Warfinger building. Um, and that would be a good location. It's just, we'd need a company combining people and putting, I mean, Arcata does this. Um, it's not at a very large volume, but it's not, um, my opinion, something that the city could sustain. It'd have to be an outside private agency. And then whatever extra storage they had, cannabis, um, um, NCGA and fishermen could use. Um, that's from the study. We've had multiple studies that demonstrate that. And then we, we had another effort for that. But if there is that company, we'd support them coming to this area for sure and work with them on finding the location. Would um, Nordic Aqua Farms be interested in that kind of thing? No. Marketing Association worked with them and they're not interested. Um, okay, thanks. So uh, the other question, I think that's spewed so long, I, I can't remember what the other question was. I, I, can, uh, I can help with you. Yeah, there Kristen can help about with whether or not the city might consider using the, oh, land the grant funding. For funding. Yeah. So, I mean, it, if it's available, we definitely would. I mean, I think the advantage to this is the streamlined permitting. Um, for some of the developments we're looking at, CEQA is exempt for, let's say, the Earth Center, um, other things that we're looking at. But if there is a need for it, I think the advantage is that pre permitting um, that we would take advantage of just like a private property owner would. Um, I think that it would, if there is a grant opportunity, the fact that it is pre-permitted would likely make us more competitive for that funding for sure. Okay, because I do think um, while we should continue with all the great efforts we're making to partner with businesses and to recruit new businesses and obviously develop existing smaller ones to grow, uh, that it would help the city if if the city considered making more investments and developments themselves i'm just not sure if current like business investments are going to be enough to develop it out at least in the way that we we dream it will be yeah yeah i agree i think that um we have been really successful i mean just this summer you know we have close to 100 million dollars in investments and in development you know just in Old Town and in the Broadway area and Banco and the different projects in the Marine. So I think that there is interest within this area and it's growing. And I had a lot of conversations with um, businesses. We have a very good opportunity out at the Brainerd project. We have an interested property, I um, mean, in an interested buyer that wants to buy that property and is looking at a, a pretty big development, not big development, but to utilize that property that would bring a lot of jobs to this area. Where, where's Brainerd? It's the California Redwood Company that's- Oh yeah, sure, from sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah, right across from Harvey Harper. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Cassidy Banducci. I'm representing the Design Review Committee. I'm currently the chair. Um, I think from a design review perspective, obviously, um, you know, we're going to care about the aesthetics and, and the quality, um, but I think most importantly is the experience and tying in, you know, everything I've heard from everybody else of, of how people experience the space. So I think, you know, balancing um, the built environment with open environment is going to be really essential to the success of this. We have a, a huge resource right here, the Humboldt Bay, which is beautiful. Um, so I'd really like to tap into that and, and see us really engage um, with that as you know a really unique opportunity along this waterfront. Um, and my question for staff maybe is, uh, um, you know, is there any consideration for like outdoor recreation space to be integrated into this, you know, to um, you know support youth in our community? Um, or even, you know, adult sports as well um, in relationship to the development of housing and, and any other, you know, commercial use that's going to be planned for down here. Uh, so the, I know Halverson Park, you know, will, will remain the okay. main park part. Um, and there are, and Miles can elaborate on that, but, you know, one of the things that prohibit development in the plan area right now, especially housing, are open space requirements per dwelling unit. It was, Kristen, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's like 400 square feet per dwelling unit or 200 if you have group usable. And we found over the years that it's been really prohibited, prohibitive to developing housing. So, you know, the waterfront trail will definitely remain, Halverson Park, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to come up with strategies for sea level rise and, you know, the part by the blue ox, like th that could maybe stay as, um, you know, accommodate sea level rise and not be developed because it already has kind of been taken over by nature. So, you know, there will be, you know, the boardwalk and the waterfront trail, but as far as um, requiring each dwelling unit to have a specific amount of open space, I'm not so sure that that would be effective in spurring development. But that's not course. what I was oh, leading okay. to more like, Sorry. you know, like maybe a sports complex or some oh. soccer fields or a baseball, you know, a shared resource that brings in the community from outside of <laughs> or within Eureka, outside of Eureka. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there's just um, I also yes. serve on some other boards. So this is this is always a big topic of conversation, you know, when it comes to youth sports and and. Mm -hmm. um, providing them also opportunities. So if that could be a resource for the residents and the city, um, just thought I'd throw that one out yeah, there. Yeah, it's like so. a principally <laughs> permitted use, certainly. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, Jack, you had a question? Oh, go ahead, Miles, say what you want to say first, and then I'll, I'll, I, I had a question about the 200 and 400 square foot thing. Okay, so yeah, like Caitlin said, the, you know, the open space there, especially the waterfront trail, when you're looking between Del Norte and Tuesdale, there's that is not going to go anywhere. As a matter of fact, we'll probably take use that as an opportunity to do sea level rise adaptation, living shorelines, those type of things. Um, but that's not going to be going anywhere. We are looking at the, the pole shed property and rezoning that pole shed property for recreational use. That's the property that's just north of the Bayshore Mall parking lot. Um, it's zoned currently now CDI, and we have every intention on either changing that to recreation or public or something like that. We've had interest in um, DMX, um, other things like that, that potentially would be a good fit with the, with the trail. Um, as far as a, a complex or something like that, I don't know. We are looking at property and, and partnering with other government agencies on stuff that's inland for, for those type of facilities. But um, Along the waterfront, I don't see something similar to the Adorney happening um, anytime soon. We are going to be revamping the Adorney, so it's not much like a gym. It's more of a community center. And so that is not going anywhere, and that'll go more into that direction. And we have funding in place to rehab the trail through Haverson Park, as well as add a new playground there. So we added the playground. Well, we renovated the playground adjacent to um, the, the library, and then we added the playground that's at the foot of Del Norte as a part of the trap, uh, and added the dog park there. Um, we will be adding another playground that'll be um, 
basically adjacent to the Sackle Amphitheater by the Adorney, which will have a marine theme to it, and that's going to happen within the next year or so. Um, so, yeah, and as Caitlin said, the um, Towerson Park isn't going anywhere. That 3.2 acres yeah. will always be there. I think that will likely remain as open space, and it wouldn't really make sense to have two community centers right next to each other. So, Miles, can I ask, and, and, and Caitlin, so Caitlin, you mentioned the 400 square feet uh, and or 200 square feet for multiple dwellings of, of so where does that regulation come from? Shared, that's currently required in our coastal zoning code. That's a, that's a California requirement, not something that the city of Eureka could get around? Nope. Well, no, that is a, that is a city of Eureka requirement cu currently within the coastal zone, which is where where the plan area is. Well, we could we as the city of Eureka and and I, Adelo here actually being on the planning commission would probably know more or you. I, I, but that's that's a self-imposed restriction. We are. That's a self-imposed restriction. Full stop. It kind of, I mean, we still have oversight by the Coastal Commission. We are going through an LCP update right now. And there will be changes made to that on the sharing by right, KG. Right. So we have proposed changes as it relates to that current regulation in the LCP. And we'll be trying to make it as beneficial for us as possible, but it still has to go through the Coastal Commission process and, and have them bless it. Sure. Yeah, it we used to have that requirement in the inland zone. And then when the zoning code was update, it was updated, it was removed. And we're trying to mimic our inland zone as much as we can in the coastal zone. Cool. And I am not sure who put their hand up first. So. It was me. <laughs> I call her and Mark. Yep. I'm, I'm a school Zach. teacher. I, you learn to track these things. Yes. Um, so I wanted to say to I live close to this area. <clears throat> And when we access the waterfront, we mostly go past the library. And then if you go around by what used to be the Looking Glass and is now the Humboldt Bay Bistro, there's a little like informal trail that goes down. It would be awesome to have more actual neighborhood access, easier access down to Halverson Park. It's difficult now. Um, and I'm not sure if the city is planning to formalize that path or create new, more formalized pathways, but that would be a great way to ensure that neighbors utilize the space is making it easier to access. Um, yeah. So that's one thing. And then I, um, you know, definitely from the planning commission, wearing my planning commissioner hat, we would love to see as much, you know, information on the LCP update and how that vision and those regulations will change kind of in tandem with this plan going through. Um, there hasn't been you know, much information yet, which makes complete sense. But as it goes through, it'd be great to know how are these, you know, gears turning to hopefully get us to an updated LCP that will make some of these things easier and what will be the impacts of the downtown too, especially as we continue to regulate projects down there. So um, as much information as we can get, even just a framework on the LCP update would be much appreciated by the commission. So I think in the next couple of months, we'll be, um getting out information to planning commission, public, that kind of thing regarding the uh, draft of the land use plan update. So and it, it's close. Yeah, and it's very much so based on all the sentences that we had about the general plan and getting the information about the policies put into the general plan, trying to get that into the LCP. Um, as That's far super as that, exciting. And the whole plan is very exciting. We're, we're very, we're very thrilled. And so as far as that trail, that is, owned by the NCRA and the NCRA is now converting into the Great Redwood Trail. Right. I think that would provide a better opportunity to formalize that. It's somewhat formalized, but it's not changed. Another thing that'll help with what you're talking about, being close to M Street is as a part of the six and M development for the scattered site project for Link, um, the intent is to turn M Street into a bike boulevard. And that should help with some of that access that you're talking about. And we're also looking at a bike boulevard on C Street, much to the chagrin of our public safety, but we're still looking at it. Mm -hmm. Calder, did you um, have a question or want to make a comment? Oh. 
think he accidentally yeah uh, i was sorry idea. yeah i was like there i am okay yeah i am uh, i'll just toss in my two cents uh from the arts and culture commission perspective i uh, i just want to say i agree with a lot of what's already been said here i think mixed use is uh, wonderfully important right now. Uh, sea level rise uh, mitigation has to be accounted for. I also strongly agree. Even having a venue in that in that district, I I don't think parking is an issue, and um, I just I think we need to put that one to bed and uh, move forward for sure. Uh, things that personally, from a, from an arts perspective, uh, that I would love to see happen as part of this development uh, and talking to other artists. Um, one thing is uh, live workspaces, spe specifically as part of mixed use. Uh, you know, that's very important for artists right now. A lot of artists are struggling for finding housing, yeah. and they want to be able to do their work in Old Town, which really is a, kind of like the cultural hub of the county. Um, and also at the same, on the same uh, hand as that, uh, I think that in making sure that we uh, include mixed use and live workspaces that we need to include um we need to include guidance and regulation to make sure that that doesn't start the slippery slope towards uh, gentrification um because that's something that's been seen in a lot of uh mm -hmm. similar areas that use um live work you know, live work developments uh so that'll be one the second one would be as far as the waterfront area itself there's a lot of opportunities there for some um already being used for amazing outdoor events i mean like the Friday night markets, as well as over the Thursday, the Thursday night uh, bands that play. There's a lot of great stuff happening out there. I think that there's a lot of opportunity to develop that in the future, um, both in the short term, just with a bit more infrastructure support, as well as in the long term, with some nicer venues uh, that are suited for larger events down there, specifically on the waterfront. Because as, as it was mentioned before, and I absolutely agree with, it's incredibly scenic down there. And I think it would be a tremendously huge, it already is a tremendously huge draw for a lot of people locally and could be a huge draw for tourists in the region as well. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Caroline Perez. I should introduce myself. Um, I'm from Design Review. Um, I agree with what Cassidy has said. And I, you know, I feel that, that our committee is looking for a harmonious mixed use infill. And, it, and we're not necessarily looking for a Victorian style buildings at every like Travis Snyder did a really nice beautiful building that fits with the old town um, area and yeah that's what so everything that's been said has been exactly what I'm looking at thanks Caroline uh, Mark did you have some comments um I did but I think I'm just I'm ready to listen at this point <laughs> Okay. Okay, Jack. So, so I, I a couple quick things here. So, first of all, I don't. We keep talking about mixed use, which I'm completely in favor of. I got to be honest, though. I, the dogs and I walk down there two or three times a week. There are so many vacancies down there, and, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but until there's foot traffic down there, until there are people living down there, we're not going to get that. You know, I mean, literally, how many? And you guys would know. What's our vacancy rate? And let's call it Seventh Street down to the Bay um, retail space. It's got to be thirty percent or something like that, or more. And um, and I'd love to see it filled in. And I forget they called it. God bless you. You hit it on the head. Parking is not the issue. The Bayshore Mall's got acres of parking, and it's dying on the vine. It's it's. We need foot traffic. We need you know. In school, I say butts in seats because that's what we get paid on. So I guess my question, two things is. Why only 140 units? That to me, you could put 140 units in there and unless you've got the Von Trapp family living in each one of them, you're talking 250, 300, 400 people. That's not gonna change the dynamic. So I, I, I don't have an answer, you guys know, but why so, why so small, why so timid? And then the other question, and this is more of a, 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 a why not or what if, Cal Poly, is there something about them? There, there's, you know, I, I, my school district's in Arcata. There's not enough room there. Have we reached out to them? I'm sure you guys have, but um, about putting student housing in there, um, which make it as dense as we possibly can, because those, they'd be, well, they'd be eating here and buying food, buying stuff from our people. So I'll, I'll shut up and listen. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Miles take the Cal Poly question, but I just want to clarify that, yeah, you know, right now in the plan area, you need a conditional use permit to have a residential use in Old Town, even on the upper floors. So that is something that definitely needs to go away, right? So if we have more people, then that'll fill the, the retail vacancies, right? So um, that's a, one, one of the main that is a main goal of this effort. And as far as the 115 units, yeah, we definitely want as many housing units as we can. Um, I'm not quite sure where that number came from because we initially got grant funding to do this plan before I was a staff person. Um, But that's what HCD, that that was our goal because the funding was supposed to plan to support the development of more housing. So yeah, by all means, we would love more than just that amount of housing. And as far as Cal Poly coordination, I will let Miles uh, talk about that. So yeah, we obviously we partnered with them on the Earth Center. Um, right now, it's proposed to have 96 students that'll be in that Earth Center. Um, we have direction to increase the density. So we're working with Cal Poly right now on the pre-development agreement with Servicos and look at incre- increasing that. We're also looking at a lot of other properties that would create, you know, five to 10, well, at least five times the amount of housing for not only students, but also for um, uh, professors and graduates and those type of things. So yes, we are talking to them and that number is low. I don't know where it came from, but it's very, we can get much higher than that. It's, remember, it's only in this area too. We have a lot of other developments that are gonna create more housing outside of this area for sure. But I think the the LCP update is a a huge component of this to make this uh, a lot easier for folks to do. I mean, we do have private, uh, it's what's great, like Will Adams project across from Los Bagels, he's doing another project similar to that at Third and G. Um, That's huge to see that happening where you don't usually see market rate, multifamily things going on, especially here. And so um, it's good to see that that's, financially um, sustainable and financially available for, for people, so. Great, well, I'd like to um, move us along to our next activity, if possible. Aubrey. So, uh, Aubrey. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I did not see that. Aubrey, take it away. Thank you. Uh, I guess my, I had a few just ideas that I can shoot out at a later time, but my main question was, um, can you remind me if Eureka Main Street's geography, like cover area, is only in the Old Town District and like part of Commercial Bayfront, or if it also crosses into the Library District? It doesn't go up to the Library District, but it does come over into where I'm at, Fifth and K, um, along that area, and a little bit more to the west of there. It doesn't go up into the Library District, though. Um, I I am wondering if it'd be beneficial to look at expanding that um, to provide some more like support and and encourage more events in some of those other areas that we're hoping to grow and develop as well. So that would be a a Main Street board decision. And I think that when it was established, it was based, I'm sure it's possible, but I can bring that up with Amanda and see if that's um, what it would take to do that. Okay, great. Um, If I may, I'm going to share my screen again so we could do our next um, back and forth conversation activity. So let's see here. So next we're going to do the SWOT survey. It's a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I'm gonna give a couple examples and then I'm gonna switch to our online Jamboard. And you guys, as you talk to me, I will type in. So for example, something that's a strength, you see the S box, it's something that's helpful and internal within the plan area. So an example of a strength would be our historic buildings. Uh, Also like the waterfront, our boardwalk. Um, our, our business community. Um, let's see, next would be the opportunity. So something that's helpful, but external. It could be Cal Poly, um, our Bay to Zoo Trail, connecting the waterfront to the zoo, the, the trail connection between Arcata and Eureka that's supposed to come from the county soon. Uh, something that's harmful and internal would be considered a weakness. 
And so, for example, like our current local coastal program standards, like I said, you need a conditional use permit to have a, a, a residential use, even in the upper floors of existing buildings in the old town area. Um, the open space requirement per dwelling unit was was harming uh, the development in the area. And then some threats, it's something that's harmful and external would be like sea level rise and things that we can't really control. Uh, also, like the current housing market and the economy. So anything that's a threat, we want to try to turn into an opportunity, something that's harmful, we want to try to make it um, a a strength. So I'm going to switch now again to our Jamboard, oh, Jamboard and um, take it away. So if anyone uh, wants to just speak up on what they think is a strength, weakness, opportunity, threat, sometimes it could be in between the two. Maybe it, it's a, it could be helpful or harmful, right? But we want to try to move it over to helpful. So take it away and I can start typing it in. Caitlin, where are you going to share the board? Oh, I thought I was sharing it. Sorry. <laughs> Alder has his hand up. Thank you. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Jack, you really are a great school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I had mentioned this actually at an earlier swap board. I think we've done um, uh, Caitlin, uh, and I called it nimbyism at the time, uh, not in my backyard, but I also want to specifically call that out because we talked about it before. It's nimbyism around the parking lots. It's the like that we that there's a lot of people who are just refusing to let go of parking lots in the district, even when there are amazing projects that could go into them and uh, just transform the area. But you know, people people come and say like, no, those are beautiful parking lots. We can't get rid of them. It's, no. <laughs> Maybe to keep parking lots. And I'd argue there's an opportunity there. I, I think some some public education, for lack of a better term. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't think it's that profound that we realize there's tons of parking and, and there's lack of, tra it's, it's more foot traffic. But if some of those businesses were making that argument that, hey, you know, I'll, I'll, I'd rather have more people coming to my doors and worry less about parking, that might help shift that conversation because I agree with Caller. It's a, I, I think it's a, it's not irrelevant, but at this moment, I think it's an, it's, it's an argument that doesn't, that isn't, isn't relevant at this moment. Maybe, maybe some future where we really do have a parking issue, but right now we have a, not enough people going into stores issue. Yeah. I, I, mean, we, <laughs> I feel like we're starting this off in kind of like an esoteric way, but I would love to riff on that and say, I think also education about the connection between activity and public safety. I think yeah. in Old Town and downtown, you know, people have a lot of complaints about not feeling safe, not wanting their kids to go down by themselves, you know, not wanting to walk from their cars, you know, but it's like, well, if you don't want to spend two blocks walking between your car, really, like, <laughs> we don't need more parking, we need more people on the street, we need more appropriate activity, so you feel safe. And by bringing more people into Old Town to shop and to live, you know, that's a huge benefit yep. for the city and for those people who now have a place to live. So I think that really trying to hit that home might be helpful as well. I see that as an opportunity. Yeah. Well, I, I have a thing. I, I don't, I think there's plenty of parking down there, but I, but I go down there as, you know, to shop or eat, but I'm thinking that, that they're also complaining about there's no parking for their employees. So if you work down there, you have to, I mean, you would have to know, you would figure out where to park eventually, but a lot of people want to park in the two hour parking spaces. So then they're, they're having to go out on their brakes to move their car to another two hour parking space. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have my little places that I park and go into old town and I might have to walk two or three blocks, but I always know they're vacant, but I don't work down there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a different, whole different thing. That's a really so, good point. And I wonder too, if this could be part of an opportunity to actually do some of that 15 minute parking or like the metered parking that we've been talking about for years, if we could actually wrap that in to this plan. I don't know where engineering is at on that. And please, while I'm typing these things, if I have them in the wrong box and I'm getting it wrong, please call out and correct me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
I think on the lines of less automobile parking that we need to have better um, like facilities for bike parking, like uh, bike racks that are set up properly, um, large events or events with uh, bike valets. So you just check in your bike and you don't have to clean every little gadget off it. So someone else doesn't, doesn't do it for you, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so would uh, you say right now we don't have enough, so that's internal harmful and that's something that we, we want to turn into a strength? We don't have enough or um, they're just set up in, you know, like a lot of parking, bike parking is on a thing bolted to a light post that's right next to where someone's car door is going to open up. So if you park there, you're kind of like hindering people getting in and out of their cars. You know, it's just like barely fit in somehow kind of a thing. And it would be nice if there were, uh, I don't know, bike parking that didn't interfere so much or, or that's, you know, and it's nice to park your bike in front of a window of a business where people are around, you know, so that it's your bike is seen. And so, and then there might be something for pedestrians that might be nice, like maybe a place to check, you know, you buy stuff, maybe go to another store, maybe you don't want to carry three bags of stuff everywhere you go. Maybe there could be some kind of a locker set up or something like that. Or maybe we need to look into what makes it more pleasant for people who are walking to go downtown and spend some time there, you know? Okay, so maybe it's internal. It could be harmful because we don't have pedestrian lockers right now where people could. Yeah, yeah. Which could be, an opportunity as well. I wonder if we could put it in the middle. <laughs> okay. Is there anything that uh, you guys think is a strength that we have down in the plan area right now? You know, like the library, the, the boardwalk, yeah. the bay. Uh, I, I think, agree. go ahead. Go ahead, please. It's fine. I was going to say, I was going to mention the library um, as a, a strength and something we could continue to build out as a community center because they, they aren't just uh, places you can get books from these days and that's not always known by the public. Um, but it's doing a lot right now, so I think it's a strength. I like the, like currently there's several intersections that have bricks in them. And I think that that helps calm down, you know, makes it more of a place to be rather than a place to travel through. And so um, I think is a nice traffic calming device actually. Which is a, could be a strength and an opportunity, right? We have some now, and we want to. Yeah, build I think more. We, we need, you know, as we build out, we should have more of that. I'd say. Caitlin, I put some stuff in the chat, as well for strengths. Oh, it looks I, like you got it. I'm getting them. Oh, great! Yeah, thank you. Like right now, I can only see my jam board. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for putting in there. Let's see any more threats. I mean, we've, we've talked about NIMBYism um, to removing or not increasing parking, anything else, you know, we know sea level rise is definitely one. Um, any, anything else? I yeah, when I can, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I think lack of support from the Coastal Commission could be seen as a threat if, if they are not supportive. I also wanted to underline uh, something that uh, Jack brought up, which I, I feel very strongly about too, uh, and which is, I mean, which is the the uh, occupancy rate on retail businesses. I mean, I think that 
I think that uh, Jack's suggestion of like, we just need to get more foot traffic and that will help things as well. Um, I, I absolutely agree with that. And at the same time too, I also think that there are certain business, business storefronts which have just been unoccupied. At this point, I looked at them for like years and I'm like, okay, this, this, this is just becoming a blight and we need to have some, some changes to city policy with how we, how we address those properties. So maybe our occupancy rate, well, it could be a threat and uh, a weakness that we definitely want to increase, which will be our strength. And it, and it could be an opportunity to pull people from the outside area in to increase our occupancy. And I think right now, but it's being addressed as well. The weakness is that we've got some of these legacy zoning regs that make it more difficult but as per the earlier conversations by um miles and uh caitlin and, and you folks from the city apparently they're you're working on that uh to hopefully sync that up state Plant coastal commission uh allowing to be um lined up with what the rest of the city has which would be um i'm assuming a big step in the right direction yes hey can i ask one opportunity too i you know, I mean, I, I keep back talking like foot traffic, like it's, but I, but I don't know what the hell that means. What is there? Is there a study, or is there a uh, is there a way of what would the what would the density, the population growth down there, be to um, need to be to actually have an impact? I, 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 you know, I get it. One hundred and forty is not enough, but does that mean is it another twelve hundred people living down in that area? Is it three thousand four hundred and sixty seven? I'm assuming city planner type folks have some tools where you could even get a um, get an idea of you know if we get to this level of I'll use the term density, but at least this level of population in this area that you know, statistically speaking we should see um, we should see an impact on how much business our local businesses are getting or something like that. To have that number as a goal or at least as a data point, I think would be really would be a neat offer. It would be really useful. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. So the 2040 general plan, um, you know, it was citywide, but it's mm -hmm. not adopted in the coastal zone. That's why we're doing this effort. And we're really, this effort is building upon what we've done in the 2040 general plan. So the environmental impact report done for that effort looked at increasing housing in the housing dwelling units in the overall city by Kristen, if correct me if I'm wrong, maybe like 1,800 and then mm -hmm. adding like a couple hundred thousand square feet of, of um, commercial, which mm -hmm. could be mixed use commercial. Mm -hmm. So um, so we anticipate in the next, you know, at least till 2040, yeah, accommodating up to 1,800 dwelling units, you know, and in the past, the city would maybe give building permits for half a dozen, you know, yeah. so yeah. Um, that environmental review did look at the capacity of like existing, you know, city facilities and sewer and water to accommodate that growth. So this planning effort is trying to implement the vision for this area as identified in the 2040 general plan. So there is, if you look at that environmental document on our website, it's you know, like a thousand pages or something, but um, you could go just in the introduction, it'll tell you how many dwelling units and how much square feet per um, land use designation, i.e. the districts, right? Um, yeah. So I, I, that, no, is, that, that, make, that makes sense. The city, you know, stated broadly, I guess, but, but, you know, the reality is, if if miraculously a 5000 5000 you know housing for 5000 suddenly materialized you know next to sequoia park those folks are not going to be impacting downtown in a direct way versus down there so i'm really curious just in that in that narrow targeted area which you know broadly 7th street to the bay or something i'm just i'm just curious i, I, I don't i don't mean to put you on the spot right now i'm, I'm just it, it intrigues me that you know what what is your What's your what's your density where you start to get this positive multiplying effect or what is it a, a positive feedback loop of um, people that are there and then people are eating at the restaurants and people are working there and and and, and so on and so forth. So I, I'm just curious. Right, and so also in the general plan, it calls for um, density and intensity maximums and. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, these are going to be considered mixed use zoning districts. So it's not going to be based on density, like how many dwelling units per acre. Yep. It's going to be based on intensity. So it's going to be based on your building height, your site coverage and your mm -hmm. floor area ratio. Well, actually not site coverage. I'm sorry. So in the general plan, I think in these areas, old town, oh gosh, I can't say it off the top of my head, but That's it's, right. it's like a four or five or something of a, of a floor area ratio, meaning the size of the lot if you times that, so say like it's a 10,000 square foot lot, if your maximum far is four, you can have 40,000 square feet of floor area on that 10,000 square foot lot, which will be regulated by the height of the building, mm -hmm. right? And so, and then how many dwelling units you could get in that would be based on the minimum size of a dwelling unit in the building code, which right mm -hmm. now is like 150 square feet. So we do know kind of how dense we want each or intense each area. Um, I think the maximum building height would be like a hundred feet. Mm -hmm. So, um, is that like but, the courthouse or something like that? I don't know how, I'm sorry, apologies. Um, yes. I'm not sure how tall the courthouse is. I mean, a hundred feet is pretty tall. Yeah, um, the, yeah. the inland, the zoning code actually already allows, um, our old, our current old code allows up to hundred feet. Interestingly enough mm -hmm. in, the in the along the waterfront anyways except for between the first road and the sea i think it was limited to like 50 feet you know to keep few scapes but um yeah i'm not sure as far as that statistic on you know how many people you would need to um impact the businesses but we definitely are trying to in increase the density and intensity in this area mm -hmm. to kind of match what was historically here sure yeah cool thanks Cool. Oh, great. Well, we have a lot of strengths and opportunities. So yeah, any more weaknesses that we can um, try to turn around into, into a strength, any current weaknesses, any more current threats you guys can think of? I was thinking, I, I suggest the vehicle terrorism threat. And I was thinking maybe uh, streets could be designed with retractable barricades so that you you know if there is some big event it's easy to set the place up so you can't just drive a car through it like no nice looking retractable barricades because you know i think there's some t rails down there right now that are painted yeah k rails but okay you know, thank you, you. sorry those somewhere i was thinking of like steel bollards that just you know, when you're not using them, they go straight down into the road or something like that. And it's a smooth service. So you can drive vehicles over them. You know. So we have about five minutes left. Any final thoughts, Caitlin? Uh, yeah, if you guys want, I can, we can continue this or I can switch over to the presentation and kind of go over where we've been and where we're going. That probably would be important. So let me switch my screens. And then also this um, SWOT analysis is on our website. So if you wanted to just do your own personal one, you can totally do that um, if you go to, and I'll give you the website later. Okay, so let me get back to our presentation. Okay, so briefly, oops, from here. Okay, so I'm briefly going to go through what we've done so far and apologies to people that have already watched our, our meeting. So in 2022, Caitlin, we did hold our first Caitlin, workshop. Oh, yep. Sorry, you're still on the squat screen. Oh my goodness. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stop. How's that? There you go. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. So uh, let me start over again. So in March, 2022, we did have our first workshop. Um, online where we did a word cloud exercise for each district to develop the themes that you'll see on the website. We also did VVOX polling for feedback on priorities related to mobility, public parks and spaces, housing, business and jobs and tourism. The results of these interactive exercises were used to develop the interactive map on the website um, and the, then also the survey questions on the website. So um, these um, interactive exercises that we did were to refine the vision of each district as laid out in the 2040 general plan. So that's why I keep stressing that this effort is a continuation to 
implement, you know, what has already been done and build upon uh, for the 2040 general plan. Um, and then in April, if, my, if I can... In April, 2022, we updated the website to answer, answer more Q and A questions we received at the March 10th workshop. So yeah, please check out the website. When I give you the web address, you can watch all the videos on there. Um, and which will, it, it's, it's pretty interesting if you, to see kind of the, especially the polling exercises that were done. Uh, in June, 2022, we did provide an update to, or I'm sorry, we did our workshop, our second workshop presented the results of the first workshop in March. And then we also presented draft develop or not draft um, conceptual development scenarios. So there's three sites picked in each just one site in each district, three total. Then there's three different scenarios. Like one was for a sea level rise. One was for focusing on visitors serving and tourism. And one was for complete communities. And so there's about nine uh, conceptual development scenarios. And we do Right now, it should be on the work on the website by tomorrow, a, a slideshow showing all of those so you can see them on our website. Then in July, now we're doing our stakeholder conversations. We've held this is our full fourth one, fifth one. We have um, met with an advocacy group for members like Baykeeper, CRTP, uh, AHA, Humboldt 350, Epic. And then we had a stakeholder meeting. We invited people from Eureka Main Street, and then we had one from Eureka Chamber of Commerce. Now we're doing the uh, committee's commissions. This is the first of two, one of two, because we couldn't get everyone on the same date. So appreciate everyone uh, being so flexible and meeting so quickly. Uh, and then, oh, sorry. And then lastly, we're tentatively scheduled to present the draft specific plan in the preferred scenario, which um, will be which will be selected of all the feedback that we've received uh, to the planning commission and the city council for review and comment at a hybrid meeting in November, we're hoping this November. Um, so that will be available for public review. We are working, gonna work on a comment box on the website um, that'll be specific to the specific plan and, and certain chapters to try to help make it easier to provide comments on that document as well, Mul multiple ways. Of course, you can always email planning directly. Um, and then we anticipate holding the actual public hearings for the specific plan and CEQA sometime next year in February or March. And those will also be hybrid in person. So here's our web, our project timeline. This is on our website. So I'm not gonna go through it um, line by line, but you can check it out there. Um, a background report is available on our website. Please check that out. We have, we're in the final review period for an affordable housing and anti-displacement strategies report. So that should hopefully be on the website in the next week. Um, they'll have lots of strategies to try to, you know, address, you know, the gentrification. I know I heard that from um, one of you. So definitely read that and pull out any, email us any strategies that you think are really important from there, that report that's going to come out to include in the specific plan. Um, also, as I stated, this, that SWOT analysis, uh, the previous meetings are already up on the website. We'll get these ones on the website. There is a link for you to do your own SWOT analysis if you want, and you can share that with your friends and family too. So uh, thank you again. Please take our survey. If you haven't taken it, check out the website, um, share far and wide about it. Check out the conceptual development scenarios. Just please check back regularly because we will, you know, uh, uh, add stuff to the website and we definitely want your feedback and I will uh, stop sharing. So yeah, www.waterfronteureka.com. Thank you. And, and I, I really appreciate everybody's it. comments down off of the chat and put them on the jam board. So thank you everybody. for. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was a really productive meeting. I appreciate it. Thank you, Caitlin Thank and Kristen. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.